Good morning. This is Friday, April 9th, 2021. We're here to, to deal with H195, which is a bill having to do with facial recognition technology. Seems like a simple little bill. So Michelle could walk us through this simple little bill. It'd be appreciated. Sure. Good morning, everybody. Yep. Um, so I'm going to start out, it is a, a short bill, but I wanted to give you a little bit of the history um, as a reminder. So uh, last year in I believe Act 166, there was a provision that the General Assembly passed uh, establishing a moratorium on the use of facial recognition technology by law enforcement. And so you should, can you see that up on the screen? Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Uh, so you'll see there the, establishing the moratorium um, uh, unless the use would be permitted with respect to drones or existing provision of law. Um, and you'll see in subsection B uh, with the with the terms that are used with regard to facial recognition, facial recognition technology. Um, so, uh, so it's up to you. So there's so currently a moratorium, but you have obviously the ability to specifically authorize any exceptions to that moratorium or to lift that moratorium. So what you have in H195 is creating a narrow exception to the use of this type of technology for law enforcement, uh, specifically when it involves cases uh, pertaining to sexual exploitation of children. So you guys have been dealing with H18, so you're familiar with this chapter. And um, when we talk about uh, sexual exploitation of children under chapter 64, that is primarily the chapter that deals with the uh, production, possession, viewing, et cetera, of child sexual abuse materials. There also is the luring statute in that chapter as well. Um, so you see here in the bill as passed by the house in uh, section one, subsection A, so notwithstanding the language that I just showed you that was enacted last year, the General Assembly is authorizing the use of facial recognition technology by law enforcement for a criminal investigation into sexual exploitation of children. So subsection B is where the limitations come. Can you, um, sorry, Michelle, can you it, go down? Go, yeah. Is it not showing? I think, uh, well, it's stuck on. Uh, well, this is the moratorium from last year. This isn't the bill this year. It's oh, not, I, I, it's showing it on my screen. Sometimes when I flip from one to the other, I have to close out a sharing. Okay. I feel like it won't flip. Sorry about that. That's all right. So I'm always unsure if what I'm seeing is the same as what you're seeing. Uh, okay, no, that's. <clears throat> all right, I think we got the picture. Okay, sorry, hold on, I'm trying. Yep. No, no, I think we understand where we're going. I know, but you need to see, don't you want to see the bill? I, I do. It's 195, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean it that way. I meant... Oh, okay. <clears throat> um, can you see it now? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so subsection A is just the, creating the exception. And then subsection B here is creating the, um, the parameters under which that technology can be used in these circumstances. So you'll see that um, the use of the technology that's authorized by the exception in A shall be utilized only where law enforcement's in possession of an image of an individual they believe to be a victim, a potential victim, or an identified subject in the investigation. The search is solely confi confined to locating images, including videos of that individual within electronic media legally seized by law enforcement in relation to the specific investigation. And so I think a, I can anticipate the questions and I think that probably if, um, I'll ask you through all this discussion, but I think if, uh, and I don't know if uh, Matt Raymond is testifying today or is on there or if uh, David's going to do it, but um, <clears throat> they can talk to you about this is being utilized as a more efficient way to do something that they can already do, essentially. And so they can talk you through the process of how they would actually do that. And then we can circle back around to the language and make sure that you're <clears throat> Michelle, can I ask a question? Sure. So what I have in my hard copy, what was sent to me was not as passed, but as introduced. 
So they took out all the other, because um, in the as introduced, it also related to sexual assault, homicide, yes. and kidnapping. They took all that out. Yes, and okay. um, and I think the witnesses can talk to you about why they had requested it be broader there initially. Is that through there was um, a particular case and perhaps others where in during their investigation of a child sexual exploitation case, they uncovered other crimes like homicide and and other things, and they said, "Well, we want to, you know, we discovered that through using." Uh -huh case and so they wanted it if it was originally discovered through an investigation into child sexual exploitation they wanted to still be able to explore those other ones with this use and um the house committee uh preferred to limit it specific okay. to these particular cases and so it, michelle it could you scroll down just a bit okay so i do have a question about B, right toward the end, mm -hmm. it says it's confined to locating images of that individual within electronic media legally seized. So I understand what it's trying to say is they're not going to be free to go out into the broader, uh, you know, internet and, and scope around. But it seems to me that there's a little bit of slippage into what, what is on somebody's computer that might contain um, that broader internet. Um, so if the person, let's say, is um, has uh, the cloud and they have um, material that's in the cloud, is that considered um, within electronic media legally seized? I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Perhaps because the AG's uh, office would. All right. Seems like something we should clarify because I, I think one, one tendency is to look at a computer and say, okay, only what's in there is, is what's in there. But but there are enduring connections, even when you're not on the internet, um, to broader databases. And I'm just wondering if it opens it up to say, if the person had um, Facebook, let's say, and um, even if they're not connected to the internet, I'm wondering if it's possible to search within whatever was in the computer when it's shut down. So it's, it's, it's going to be dictated by the scope of the search warrant. And I just, yeah. I don't, so I think in talking to the practitioners, you can talk to them about when they're investigating these types of cases, what do, what are they usually requesting in terms of the search warrant and, and enable to, to, to search through. So I, yeah. I okay. level of practice of what they're doing out in the field. Okay. I can, I can ask those questions when the witnesses step up. Sure. Okay. Ray, were you ready to move on? I'm I'm ready. Yeah. I'm all done. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I. How could you be all done? <laughs> It's that short. It's, I'm it's, still trying to take care of S8, F7, <laughs> and you're all done. The multitasking. I'll, you know, be honest with the world on YouTube. I'm trying to multitask here. Um, and you that's okay. Okay. Our next witness is Marshall Paul, who is the appellate defender general. I've, no, actually, Marshall, we know you well. But I think we have we the do, but title. I, it's been wrong for a while, and I've never bothered to correct it. Oh. Um, mainly because I think that as it as it lists me as a juvenile and appellate attorney, 
I yeah. usually get scheduled behind commissioners and deputies, and I kind of like going after them. So, <laughs> um, but I'm the deputy defender general and chief juvenile defender for the state. Uh, and I am here with some very brief testimony because we do not oppose this bill uh, in, in the form that it passed the House. We had some concerns about the scope of the bill when it was uh, in the as introduced form and much broader. Uh, as it's been narrowed down, we don't have concerns about it and I'll explain that. So when the, uh, the moratorium on the use of facial recognition technology by law enforcement uh, was an issue last year, we supported that moratorium because of our concerns specifically about the use of these large uh, facial recognition databases, you know, some of which have been in the news. You might've heard of the databases that are run by Palantir and some other giant corporations. And there's some real concerns about the use of those because face, facial recognition technology is really in its infancy. You know, like three years ago, if you ask people about facial recognition technology, there was some software available, there was technology available, but it was not very powerful. It was not, um, it was not generally usable by law enforcement to do, you know, huge searches for small, you know, for an individual image to try to identify a person. That that's really been an explosion of technology in the last couple of years, and frankly, it still is not. It does not have all the kinks ironed out. So there's still very high rates of misidentification. And one of the biggest problems with it isn't so much the rate of misidentification, it's the disparity in rates of misidentification. So the software now is fairly good at accurately identifying white people um, and fairly bad at accurately identifying people who are not white. And that is when you are comparing an unknown image against the databases of known images. The reason why we don't have a problem with this bill is because this bill is only permits the opposite. It allows the law enforcement to compare a, an image of a known victim against an unknown pool of images, you know, for example, on a suspect's hard drive or on a, uh, you know, a hard drive full of seized media or however that, you know, however that happens to come into their possession, they're comparing a known image against an unknown image. And there's not the same problems with misidentification when it goes that way. Um, excuse me. And so really what this does, um, you know, as far as we're concerned, this does not introduce those same problems that we were concerned about last year with uh, racial disparities and the rates of misidentification. And instead, what this does is really simply automates a process that law enforcement is doing anyway. Um, and so with that in mind, as long as this bill stays limited in that way, we don't have a problem with it. Um, and so we don't oppose it. Great. Any questions for Marshall? Uh, Falco Schilling is our next witness. Thank you, Marshall. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, for the record, Falco Schilling, Advocacy Director for the ACLU of Vermont. Um, so thank you very much for having me here this morning. I think my testimony is also gonna be quite brief and echoes what you heard from Marshall Paul. Um, we appreciate the work that uh, folks put into this uh, before it came over to create the version that has passed the House. Um, we also, uh, we, we don't oppose uh, what passed the House. We appreciate the fact that this was more limited than what was originally introduced, um, and specifically for the reasons that, that Marshall just spoke to, that this would be looking for an identified individual within a set of, of images. Um, and then those images would be verified by a person which alleviates some of the concerns that we have about automated systems, um, you know, trying to identify people and then possibly arresting them from a set of images. That's where we see this technology as most problematic. And we also think that this is um, 
This shows that the moratorium that you put in place last year is working as it's intended. Um, you know, the moratorium was put in place, law enforcement came forward and they said, we have this use uh, for this technology. It's very limited, it's very specific. Um, and we were able to discuss that. And I think we came to a place where we understand why this technology be used and don't have uh, con privacy concerns or concerns about the inaccuracy of what's going to be coming out of it. So um, just to echo what Marshall said, we, we don't oppose what passed the house and appreciate the, you know, the work that went into getting the language to where it is right now. Okay, great. Um, David Schur is here from the Attorney General's office. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, committee. Uh, for the record, David Chair with the Attorney General's office. Um, a couple of the witnesses already have given us some nice summaries uh, about the import of the bill. I'll just say a couple things about how our office approaches this issue and a couple of the specific protections and, and then open myself to any questions. If there are operational questions, Commander Raymond is on the line here too, and he'll be uh, the person to answer some of those, I think. Um, so the Attorney General's office approaches the, uh, the concept of facial recognition technology with considerable skepticism. Um, the office has a lot of concern around the privacy implications of facial recognition technology, as well as the disparity uh, issues that uh, Marshall Paul spoke about. To that end, the office has sued Clearview AI, uh, which is one of the major facial recognition uh, purveyors of facial recognition technology in the country. That's, I believe that's the Palantir Corporation that Marshall was referencing as well, uh, same, same entity. Um, and we've all, you know, before we sued them, Clearview AI actually approached our uh, um, Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force that Commander Raymond heads up and offered its product and we turned it down. So we are not, uh, we refused that. So we're not, we don't approach these things uh, with eagerness, we approach them with skepticism. And that is how we designed the bill and how we were, uh, how we how we were happy to help redraft it to ensure that it stayed uh, narrow and did not, it's, these uses did not spill over in ways that were unintended or not desired. In order to make it a really narrow usage and ensure the protections that a couple of the other witnesses spoke about, there are really three protections in here. If you look at it, and I'll actually go from bottom to top. Um, the, the, the first one, which is, at the bottom here is that this is only, these are only searches that will happen within uh, electronic media, computer hard drives, thumb drives, whatever that might be, that are legally seized by law enforcement in relation to some specific investigation. Legally seized is a way of saying seized pursuant to a search warrant. It's theoretically possible that law enforcement could gain one of these by consent. I don't think that ever happens as an operational matter at the current time, and Commander Raymond can talk about that a little more. These are things that are seized pursuant to a search warrant, which means that a judge has already decided that there is probable cause that evidence of a specific crime is likely to be found in the place to be searched. So we're already talking about a narrow universe where there's already actually been some legal process that has likely um, happened in order to ensure that limitation, that limited view. Uh, the other protection which folks already talked about is that this is uh, images of known individuals. We're not, this is not searching databases to try to find people. These are searching only known individuals that could be a victim or potential victim, which is the child and, or would be the child in this case, and uh, or an identified suspect. Not, again, not looking for random people, there has to be an image that they have of a identified suspect in the investigation and search those images in order to see if um, there might be <coughs> activity going on that requires intervention, rapid protection of a child and so forth. And Commander Raymond, again, can talk a little bit more about those operational aspects. And then the final protection is just the limitation. The, these are only gonna be allowed to be used during uh, criminal investigations into the sexual exploitation of children. Uh, and again, these are investigations that are only carried out by the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force in Vermont, which means Commander Raymond and his staff. So those are the three levels of protection. And again, as uh, others have pointed out, or I should say, I'll just talk a little bit about how that happens. Right now, the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force looks through every image that it 
seizes on these devices. And they do that to see, uh, well, to assess what the criminal liability is, but also to see whether a victim might be exploited, somebody who's in Vermont that they need to uh, protect, see if the su suspect that they are investigating has themselves perpetrated some of these acts as opposed to just possessing images. Um, so these are searches that are happening now lawfully. They are searches that will continue to happen lawfully, whether or not these this, this bill is passed. So this does not expand police power in any way. All it does is allow these lawful searches to happen more quickly than they happen now. As Commander Raymond will testify, there's a considerable backlog uh, in investigations into these offenses in Vermont. There's been a dramatic rise in referrals under, this, under these crimes. Uh, and the inability to use this technology to do these searches, it has exacerbated that backlog, which is the genesis of this request. But again, this is, this is a limited request. It does not expand police power. It only allows uh, officers to do more quickly what they are lawfully allowed to do now. Okay. Mr. Chair. Senator Maruth. Um, David, I'm, I'm looking at the language and the, I guess the phrase that I am wondering about is electronic media. So it says electronic media legally seized and in talking about it, you know, uh, you and the other witnesses seem to be talking about a device um, and a hard drive or a, a phone or something like that. And I'm wondering first of all, why the word devices wasn't used there, because electronic media also includes online streaming and other, other facets of the internet. And for me, the slippage here is, if we're talking about looking at somebody's phone that's in the possession of the police, not connected to the internet, it's pretty understandable what, what is in the device. Um, but if we're talking about electronic media, then seized opens up a lot of possibilities. What, is, what does seized mean in terms of streaming video or the cloud or something like that? It, it suddenly expands out of the range of the immediate physical into the digital world. Um, and so I'm wondering your thoughts on that. And was there discussion of that? phrasing in the house. I don't believe that has been discussed yet. And I think that Senator, you're correct in terms of the intention here, which is to be limited to um, devices. Uh, and I don't actually remember the genesis of that. Uh, that's you know, the term electronic media at this point. My read of the statute is that it, it accomplishes that if it, streaming images or videos would not have, if, if the law enforcement is looking at that, that is not material that they have seized. That's mm. stuff they're accessing on the internet. They'd have to go to the, you know, the warehouse or whatever, the, um, the, the place where the media companies have stored mm. that and people are accessing it from there. That, that would not be a, that would not be material that's been seized in any way by law enforcement. So I don't think that this, lawfully permits that in its current iteration because again it wouldn't have been seized it's stuff that's <clears throat> out there somewhere else what was about the cloud Ooh, so, sorry what it, what about the cloud though if you if you have the person's device and you've legally got that and the their cloud account is tied to the device have you have you then seized legally what what they've got stored in the cloud? I, I do not believe you would have, but I would also defer to Commander Raymond in terms of those sorts of, how, how do they deal with those sorts of issues where somebody is accessing mm -hmm. things from the cloud? I think he might be, well, I know he will be the better person to ask some of those operational questions. I do think that the, <clears throat> this statute really is limited to the physical, devices that have been seized pursuant to a warrant and and if you are accessing stuff that is stored elsewhere that has not i do not read that to include things that have been seized okay and in, in that 
case, my open question to you and the other witnesses would be how you would feel about swapping the word devices for media. Certainly we're open to clarifying the intention, but I also, and whenever we do that, we just have, I just have to check yep. with Commander Raymond and, and others to make sure we're not Understood. accidentally doing something, but we were happy to clarify he's the next the witness. and we're happy to do it here. Luckily, he's the next witness. Um, just so I understand, Senator Baruch, you're, you're specifically talking about the word media yep. as opposed to a device like a thumb drive or the actual phone. Um, hard drive. Hard drive um, on my computer, the iPad and everything else and not what's um, stored elsewhere or what's been streamed on that device. Or, or yeah, or um, databases where it's shared between other other users and, and that uh, user, uh, but that might be downloaded. Um, Actually, so you may, I, I think you may have uncovered a problem with the else fast version of the electronic media, because it does mean something different. I'm not media to me. I don't know what the definition media is. Do we have a definition and statute of media, Michelle? I can read you what what uh, what I pulled up. Electronic media is media. This is not a legal definition. Electronic media is media that uses electricity, including television, radio, the internet, fax, CD-ROMs, DVDs, and online video streaming. It includes any medium that uses digital or electronic encoding of information, which is pretty expansive. Um, if you change that to devices, um, you can see the difference immediately. I'm just curious what the witnesses feel about no. that. Sure. Right. Um, any other question for David? And I'll move on to Commander Raymond. Um, Commander, welcome again. Um, and uh, please provide your prepared testimony and then perhaps answer the question about media or vice versa. <clears throat> Matt Raymond, uh, Commander of the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. And I'll just jump right to answering the question. Um, electronic media was uh, chosen for a reason. And just to back up, I'll explain the first question that I'd heard earlier. Um, if you, if we see someone's phone and they have the Facebook app on there and their Facebook data, um, people believe reside on the phone, but it doesn't actually, it resides in the cloud. So when we yeah. see the phone, <laughs> and get a search warrant and examine it, um, the phone is not in an online connected state. So none of that Facebook data uh, are very limited, only what's been cached on the phone, um, which is very, very limited information, is able to be seen from the phone in the state that we examine it. We, it would be illegal for us to go through the Facebook app, which has the keys to the person's online cloud account and view their their cloud account because that would be viewing it in real time and would actually require what is federally known as a title three warrant. Um, and uh, there's no, there's no uh, analogous route to get that information in Vermont. We, we were forbidden from doing that. So we're only looking at it in basically what's called a dead box state. It, none of the links are active to online cloud service and activating and going through those would be illegal. Um, hopefully that makes that more clear. Well, uh, it, yes and no. So okay. how, in other words, what you're saying, as I understand you, is that you're just interested in the dead box or the device and what's in it. Yeah, but I'll get to the second part of electronic media. I haven't got okay. there yet. Um, okay. I just wanted to explain that some people think like they have their phone and when we examine like they see all their Facebook data on their phone. But it's not on your phone. It's in the cloud, clearly, um, on Facebook servers, not on your phone. Um, so that, I just want to explain that, that part first. And then the second part is, um, so yes, one part is devices that we're obviously interested in. And that would be, you know, people's uh, phones, thumb drives, <laughs> wherever they could store uh, images or videos. However, um, we do get cloud data, but the only way we get that is pursuant to a search warrant. Um, so if somebody has... Um, uh, molested a child, taken pictures of it and stored it, say in their Google Photos. Um, so that 
may not be saved anywhere on any of their computers. There's different ways you can set up your settings on Google Photos. I'm just using this as one example, um, just so it's easier to talk about. Um, so that you can set it up so none of the pictures actually reside on your device, they all reside in the cloud. And uh, people that are doing something nefarious uh, sometimes uh, choose that option because they think they're protecting themselves better. So the only way that we get that data is by writing a search warrant, getting it approved by a judge, sending it to Google, and they send us the contents of their Google Photos. There's already protections built into uh, the uh, Privacy Protection Act. I think it was a, uh, done in 2016. Um, that limits that when they give us the, that data, we have to go through the data and excise everything that's not relevant to our investigation and only keep what's relevant to our investigation. So that would be electronic media that we get from them. We don't get a, uh, they don't send us a hard drive, right? They send us a link to download it from their secure servers. Um, so we're getting electronic media from them. Um, but we couldn't go online and, um, and just online seize data um, because that, again, that would be a title three violation. Mm -hmm. It'd be federally illegal okay, that, to do that. Thank you very much. That's much clearer. It's, I, I'm okay with that, but it is different than what we were discussing before, which was limited, seemed limited to devices. So you're saying if, if you can legally acquire um, a, 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 a database from some provider, from Google or, or from somebody else, and you can get a search warrant, get a judge to okay that and get that, then you can use this technology not to search a device, but to search this downloaded information file that you've been sent by Google. Yeah, but again, that's user specific and, and case specific. Yep. It has to be a, a child exploitation case. And then we would have yep. to have probable cause that that data has child pornography, child sexual abuse material in it for our cases. Um, yep. And, 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 the, and then- we're And as I say, I'm- Right. Sorry, I, I was right. just gonna say, I'm-, I'm I'm fine with that, but the you know I think the issue here is um, wanting to make sure we don't inadvertently open a floodgate to this technology that we're not aware of. So I'm just trying to tease out what what's actually included here by intention. So right, that, good, that would be a, good to a, have yeah, that explanation. Yeah, it would be limited to only the data that we get, uh, and the reason it says legally seized instead of search warrant is because. Um, there are cases where um, the victim has the information on their phone. Someone has been um, extorted uh, sexually, it's called sextortion. Uh, and we're getting increasingly younger and younger uh, uh, kids that are victims of that, unfortunately. Um, and the parents will sign over consent for us to get the information because uh, the suspect has sent information on to the child. Um, and then when we examine these phones, or computers, um, I and mean, we just had a, a case the other day that had one computer, one phone, and one tablet, and there were just over a million images. Um, because you have to realize every icon on a computer is an image, um, so that when we just say to our uh, uh, forensic tools, you know, pull all the images into a gallery view, um, it's going to pull up a, a, you know, in that case, it pulled up with just over a million images, and then. There's an option of we can manually scroll through each one individually, um, or we could say like if we if we have a known victim, we can use the victim's image and say show us all the images that that depict this this image. It's just a, a way to speed it up. As one example, we had a phone, we had a case um, where there was a, a a girl that was unfortunately uh, molested, and was uh, had explained that. She, it was her picture was taken with this particular phone while it was going on. Um, and it took the examiner six hours to find that image um, where we could have found it in less than a minute using, using a tool that we have. Um, mm -hmm. And again, uh, and the other uh, uh, thing just to explain is our tool is case specific. It doesn't aggregate data, doesn't save data, doesn't save any biometric information about um, the searches that are done. Uh, meaning that it's only used as a filter only. So basically we have a, a million images up in a gallery view. Um, and again, we could flip through them one at a time, or we could just use different filters. Um, there's um, a lot of different filters we can use. One of them is facial recognition. So you can enter a, a, a photo that you already have of an identified person and say, 
do, do you, is there a picture in this, in this mass of data we have, does this picture exist of this person? And it'll show you likely matches. And then it's the examiner that has to look at them and say, this is the girl, this is the girl. And typically we're looking for, uh, you know, a child uh, being sexually molested. Um, uh, and th those are the images that we're, we're trying to find in there. And so we pick those out as, and, and see the location that they're in and make a report about where they were found. Um, but the biometric data that's being used just to pop up and filter those images is not being saved, not being put as par part of some database. It's case specific, and when the case is over, you know, all that information is just saved as part of the, as part of that, you know, siloed case information. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, other other things you'd like to tell us or questions for Commander Raymond, Alice. So I'm just wondering with regard to, um, you know, saving, saving the material that you have for, you know, a case happens, but you think uh, it's going to be appealed and all of that. So I'm assuming you would save all of that, but what I'm really wondering is how does it get used by the court in terms of if someone goes to trial? How do you- Meaning, so the image is, the image is found on their, say it's found on their phone. Yes. Uh, so the forensic report will say, this image was found on this, the forensic tool tracks what you've done in the tool. And then the, um, uh, the person charged can have a forensic expert look at that data and see exactly what was done. So there's nothing done you know, behind the scenes. Um, but at the end of the day, what's really important is uh, this picture, which is usually a picture of a child being sexually assaulted, um, was found on his phone in this location. Um, and then the other part of the information is what user uh, attribution was found in that same folder to show that 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 the defendant is the person that had access to that fo uh, folder. Um, it's less important, obviously, the defense expert would be able to look at how it was found, but it's less important to see how it was found. It's like saying, I found the murder weapon under the bed, but did you use your flashlight to illuminate it or did you just look under and see it? It's, it's, if you had a search warrant to search that location, it really doesn't matter how you saw it. I mean, it's where it was found and what the object is of. Yeah. So, so when you get to court, um, is the image become part of the evidence? So if we introduce a image as evidence, which we do if it goes to say a jury trial, mm -hmm. um, it's uh, entered under seal so that obviously a member of the public can't mm -hmm. just get a copy of the record and get child pornography or child sexual abuse material. Um, so, but yes, it would be shown to the jury so that they could make, make a determination either as to age or whether it depicts sexual conduct, all of which are elements of the crime. Okay, so I didn't realize there was a, a separate way where that would be sealed permanently, the image. Yes you know, thinking about privacy of that person later on. Yeah, we're, we're obviously highly protective of these images. Um, when we possess them, they're on a secure offline server um, that can't be accessed by other people. Um, and we don't, we don't provide them out anywhere. Um, we bring them obviously to, to court and have to enter them as evidence, uh, you know, in the rare event of a jury trial. And, but is the court as secure as your system in terms of what evidence they have had presented to in the courtroom? So we've always uh, put them on either a thumb drive or a disc and, uh, and displayed them and then uh, removed the, the removable material. So it's not ever been entered on <clears throat> to an electronic system of the court. Hmm. So that, that it's, it's as secure as a physical piece of evidence would be at court. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure, is that that secure? Okay, well, thank you. Uh, anything else you'd like to tell us about the, the bill or the process, Commander Raymond? I, th I think it's all been pretty well covered, unless people have, have questions. Um, I don't want to take up people's time for no reason. <laughs> um, Peggy, Judge Grierson is our next witness, but I don't see him. Yeah, I, he, was, he had confirmed, and I emailed him about a half an hour ago, and I have not heard back, so I'm not sure where well, he is. We are running significantly ahead of schedule. Everybody's yeah. been very brief. Yeah. Um, so uh, Senator Sears is off now. Um, I'm imagining Judge Grierson might take a few minutes. Mm -hmm. So um, 
unless someone has something about the bill they'd like to discuss, I'm going to suggest that we take a break until 930. And hopefully by that time, Judge Grierson will be back. Um, I imagine he will be relatively brief and we'll probably wind up taking another break before our 1030 segment on 128. But, but for the moment, let's, uh, unless there's an objection, let's take a break until 930. And Peggy, if you could just drop Senator Sears an email yep. and or, or a text. Yep. Very briefly, just wanted to sure. uh, apologize to the committee for my lack of memory around the electron, the full breadth of electronic media, and thank Commander Raymond for clarifying that for everybody. And as he noted correctly, the the search warrant piece is really the key, the key protection there. But thank you yeah. to everybody. Understood. Thank you, David. Um, okay, so mm -hmm. we'll take a break.